I want to, of course, make a few reminders. So we are still, we are again streaming on our YouTube channels at the Road Safety Unit JA. So that's YouTube at Road Safety Unit JA. You can share and access the session at any time because we will leave it up for a while. Um, and of course, this is a discussion. So please remember to jot your questions down. You can post them in the comment section for those of you on YouTube. For those of us in Zoom, you can, um, you can type them into, into the chat. But you can also just write some questions down, write your questions down. At the end of the session, we'll have our question and answer session. Um, today's topic is post-crash care. Who do we call? Where do we look to? Who is responsible for taking us to the hospital? And do you know CPR? So our presenters today is, of course, the Director of the Road Safety Unit, Ms. Deji Hudson, Hudson Sinclair. Um, there's also Sergeant Craig Bonito of the JCF Public Safety and Traffic Enforcement Branch, and Dr. Herdel Espinosa Campbell, Director of the Emergency Medical Services on the long of the National Resuscitation, my apologies, the National Resuscitation um, of the unit of the Jamaica Fire Brigade Emergency Medical Services. Ms. Norma Campbell Sr., she's a trainer at the Jamaica Red Cross. And of course, our very own Ms. Paula Fletcher Brown, Executive Director. Sorry, Ms. Paula Fletcher, the Executive Director of National Road Safety Council. Welcome one and all. And I'll, I'll invite our first speaker, Mrs. Sinclair. Please go ahead, Ms. Sinclair. Good is everyone hearing me? Yes, all I'm right. hearing. I'm You're hearing now. Yes. yes, I'm hearing you. All right, so before I start my presentation, dealing with the matter of post-crash care, I would like to first play a clip of a incident that well, a crash that someone called in from St. Mary about a particular, a person was a victim of a crash and you know, there was a media firestorm about it. It was posted on Instagram. Every, a lot of persons had a lot to say in the public arena, but it really sparked a debate amongst you know, persons at the road safety unit and other stakeholders about you know, how much the public knew about road safety um, when it came down, when it comes on to post crash care. So I'm going to play that clip and I want that clip to, you know, start giving us, you know, well, we already have ideas of what it is that we need to do about post crash care, but what we want is the public to know and understand about our roles in that arena. So I'm going to ask um, our team, our IT team to just play that clip for me. Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, me need a... Assistant at Blueberry Corner, Islington, St. Mary. This is a car accident. Good well, Jamaica Constable Report strongly recommends that all Jamaica. They can't just move him just so. I had I had him, I bleed out of him nose, you know, they can't just move him so. Hi, sir. Talk and talk to me. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, I need an assistant. Um, an individual is pointing out. Hit the light post and then hit a wall at Blueberry Con in Islington. Bleeding out of his nose. He might bleed out of his nose? Yes. He carried you back and got out of the hospital? No, vehicle unable to move. No, there's nobody in the area. There's anybody in the area? There's, um, well, we don't really want to move him unless of somebody skilled there on the place, you know, because there's something worse happened to him than whoever take fault. No. If what? If something so, worse happened to him, this is a head, this is a head trauma. But we, we don't have, um, ambulance. Don't have nobody up there, no cert, no certify, we can't deal with something like this. Uh, is there a police station here? Yeah, this is, nobody up there, no train to deal with something like this in case of emergency. No, 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 no CPR or paramedics or somebody no train up there. Sir, what time we have to take place? Um, just a while ago, right now. Not even mm. five minutes at, yet. At two o'clock at curfew time. At two o'clock at curfew, and this is an essential worker. It's a um, floor contractor that's on, the, that's on the road. Right now, because of that, about 40 people left on the road. They want to get one vehicle. We don't have, we don't know nearby. We you call a while ago. This is the command center. We are sending me four for it. Backside. Let me try to put him on a vehicle. Anybody can carry him, yeah. carry him go down there? All right, do that then. All right. That clip was from a 
recent crash that took place in Islington, St. Mary. And it brought to bear, well, it basically brought to bear to the public what happens in specific situations when, you know, persons need emergency services and are trying to get, con you know, connected to those emergency services and how there is a lack of an awareness in one, how different agencies play a role in road safety in terms of post-crash care. Now, a lot of persons were upset about, you know, specific things, you know, in regards to the police and how it was handled. But what we want the public to understand that post-crash care is a multi-sectoral um, event that in terms of what happens on a scene and how different players have a different role to play. And not all players can actually attend to, you know, victims who are hurt. Now, for road safety, post-crash care is a critical mandate of ours. And that my presentation will be understanding post-crash care in relation to road, Jamaica's road safety goals. So we are, we were just discussing that the United Nations plan for the decade of basically a decade of road safety for 2011 to 2010, we are actually a signatory and all road safety stakeholders have a part in ensuring that a, a post-crash care system is developed in our island. Now, the goal of a safe system, okay, I'm just going through this slide. And the goal of the, the we are signatures to the UN, the, the UN, United Nations Global Plan for Road Safety. And under that plan, we have a safe systems approach. And that approach is actually designed to basically guide our operations and, this, and uh, management of infrastructure in a manner that anticipates human error and accommodates for injury. And the goal is to reduce fatal and serious injuries. Now, guided by this safe systems approach, we have the roads crash, post crash pillar, which is pillar number five. Under this post crash response, the aim is to increase the responsiveness to post crash emergencies and improve the ability of health and other emergency systems to provide appropriate emergency treatment and long-term rehabilitation for crash victims. Now, for us, there are specific ideals and activities under this global plan for road safety. One is to develop pre-hospital care systems, including the extraction of victims from vehicles, as well as implementing a single nationwide telephone number for emergencies. Activity two is to develop a trauma care system to evaluate the quality of care. Also, activity three, which is to provide early rehabilitation and support to the injured patients and their families to minimize both physical and psychological trauma. And activity four, to encourage and, and the establishment of an appropriate road user insurance scheme to finance rehabilitation services. And that can come through the act of introducing a mandatory third party liability, as well as an international mutually recognized insurance scheme on the green car system. Activity five encourages a thorough investigation into crash and the application of an effective legal response, as well as provide encouragement and incentives for all employers to hire and retain people with disabilities after they've been in an accident. And finally, activity seven is to encourage and research and, de research and develop in into improving post-patch responses. Now, each country has a set of indicators, one of which is, for Jamaica is, a, is that we require a country to have third-party insurance for all Ski, well, insurance schemes for all drivers, have a utilization of our national emergency access number, as well as designated trauma centers. Optional is to have a specific trauma, to have specific trauma care required of for all emergency personnel. 
in summary, Jamaica has made some strides in achieving specific aspects of the global road safety plan as it relates to post-crash care, such as third-party insurance, such as thorough investigation as it relates to crashes and litigation in terms of finding who may be at fault, and also having a Disabilities Act of 2014. Now, we recognize as road safety stakeholders that not all activities under Pillar 5, which is post-crash care response, have been treated with. However, we are hopeful that we are able to identify the gaps within the emergency care system and address them as all players are part of this multi-sectoral initiative, which is post-crash care, which involves both the police, it involves you know, fire brigade, it involves emergency service, ambulance services, both private and belonging to the hospitals, as well as our healthcare workers. We are now, we are now opening the discussion to see how best we can treat with these gaps and work together to, come, to ensure that Jamaica has the post-crash response it deserves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sinclair. We will now take our next presenter, Sergeant Craig Bonito of the JCF Public Safety and Traffic Enforcement Branch. Sergeant Bonito, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Is everyone hearing me clearly? I'm hearing you clearly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. I just want to also send greetings to those who are joining us on the various social media platforms. The police is aware that human beings are prone to mistakes that can result into road crashes. And as a result of these crashes, a significant number of persons would have been suffered from serious life-changing illnesses. And I must say that it caused the Ministry of Health and by extension the government of this country millions of dollars to really treat crash victims annually. The fifth pillar of road safety, which is the post-crash care system, is very important. As we know that it, it, it really, the main objective it, uh, is basically to prevent avoidable and unnecessary road traffic fatality. Traffic accidents of a serious nature and those which involve injury must be investigated by the police. Whenever a police officer is called to an accident scene, the police will expedite to the scene. On arrival, we will inform police emergency whenever it is known or suspected that injury would have occurred. Further communication will be made to police emergency for them to actually enlist the service of medical personnel, enlist the service of an ambulance to actually take the crash victim or victims to the hospital. The police is guided by an acronym called COPELAND whenever we are actually responding to these accidents, right? The C is for casualty. So the, our main aim is to try and protect life. So we try as quick as possible to try get the victim to the hospital. The, the O is for obstruction, obstruction. In terms of obstruction, we will take appropriate action to minimize hazard or obstruction out there. So we'll try to ensure that the roadway is clear so that we can have a free and continuous flow of both vehicle and pedestrian traffic. So if it's a case where we'd have to maybe redirect motor vehicle and so forth, we will activate those actions. In terms of witness, we will try to establish the identity of the persons involved in the accident, as also try to get an idea as to what happened out there. We recognize that many persons mistakenly place the responsibility of safety and the responsibility of transporting accident victim from the scene of an accident to the hospital on the police, and this should not be so because the police is not trained as, as paramedics. We do not have the authority to actually care for these scratch victims. I am fully aware that it is human nature to help those who are, who are helpless and in distress. So the police will go above and beyond the call of duty, right? And actually try to remove some of these extract these crash victims from the scene, from motor vehicle, try to take them to the hospital as early as possible. We will try also to, to administer first aid, but I just want to make it 
clear to the public that it is not the responsibility of the police to transport accident victim to the hospital. Our vehicles are not equipped to convey these persons. And oftentimes, personnel get injured at, at an accident scene and left to the mercy of other personnel. And I just want to appeal to the powers that be to actually put an effective post-crash system response in place to transport these personnel to the hospital. And this in itself will minimize the risk of untrained personnel, you know, using their, their normal or their natural instinct to try and assist these victims to hospital and most times further cause injury to these persons. So just like how the police is, I would say, effective in expediting to these accident scenes, I would love to see other agencies, you know, replicating these kind of behavior. And this will definitely prevent avoidable and unnecessary road traffic fatality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergeant Bonito. Um, we will move right into the next presentation but by Dr. Kurdel Espinosa Campbell, Director of Emergency Medical Services at the Emergency Disaster Management and Special Services Branch. <laughs> Dr. Campbell, please go ahead. All right, good afternoon and thank you for the invitation to participate in this very important and very topical area. And, um, you know, it really is quite distressing to see the statistics climbing the way it is, but nonetheless, let us move on with the presentation. Let me just get rid of this screen. So my talk today is really on the medical aspect of the post crash response, uh, response in our country. And as you alluded to um, earlier, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution sometime last year in August, 2020, to improve global road safety worldwide. And they proclaimed the decade of action for road safety for the year 2021, this year to 2030. Having not achieved much in the decade prior, they have revisited their strategies with the ambitious target of preventing at least 50% of road traffic deaths and injuries by 2030. Um, let me try and move the slide along, right. So as you've mentioned before, the five pillars um, were, uh, include road safety management, pillar two, safe roads and mobility, safer vehicles, pillar three, and safer road users, pillar four. And what's relevant to us is the post-crash response. This system or pillars have been proven to be cost-effective and offers a reasonable solution in reducing our road crash injuries and fatalities. It also opens up our eyes to increasing our responsiveness in country to post-crash emergencies. And it should really trigger the ability to improve the health for all our persons who are injured in Jamaica. And of course, the earlier we intervene as clinicians, as first responders, it means persons have a good chance of survival. It's interesting to note also that persons in low and middle income countries occur for more fatalities than exist in what we call first world countries. And if we were able to make a good dent in the, um, the response in our country, we could be salvaging at least half a million persons uh, worldwide. So in order for the post crash recovery to really work effectively, it requires uh, a number of other uh, key elements to be in place. And that includes research and information, legal support and legislation, collision events analysis, uh, injury care that we are responsible for, and of course, after the injury, the debilitating effects that can happen. But research and information must not be overlooked. For instance, at the scene of the accident, the crash data to involve the police, the insurance company, and the auto industry must be looked at since it can inform preventative and corrective measures. So no accident means no injuries and no deaths, and so it wouldn't be a cost burden to our country. The research at the hospital level is also important, and I'm happy to say 
that in Jamaica, within the health system, we do have a number of um, interest surveillance system. One of them is the Jamaica interest surveillance system. We have the patient administration system, both of which were established for about 22 years now, and it really provides a good information base for injuries that we see in our country. At the University Hospital of the West Indies, they do have a trauma registry that's exclusively managed by them, but it does give a reasonably good impression as to what obtains in our country. And what we can infer based on this statistic is that at least 20% of these accidents end up in our hospitals. Of course, the legal and legislative framework goes without saying, but for, for the injury care and the post-crash response, the first response involving the Jamaica Fire Brigade EMS is crucial and pivotal in how we get patients to the hospital. And in my next slide, I'm gonna show you exactly how this system is integrated. This emergency care system framework was, um, the infographics was designed by the WHO and what it really speaks to is how well around the world injured patients seek care in a variety of ways, especially in low and middle income countries. Frontline workers, of course, that you see here and in our ambulance um, are really pivotal. In Somebody's mic is open, I'm sorry. All right, frontline providers manage um, a number of injuries to include children, adults, pregnant women, and cases such as myocardial infarctions or your common heart attacks, your asthmatic attacks. Cardiovascular and cerebrovascular accidents are some of the common, common diagnosis that they see. But for us, we really wanna focus on the trauma response um, care. Um, so you have somebody on the scene of an accident in the ideal world, and this is what we want to build out in Jamaica is to have that person call a dedicated telecommunications network by a dedicated number. That person who is so trained is able to dispatch the relevant emergency service. That service may be an ambulance, it may be the Jamaica Fire Brigade, or it may be the police who will be trained in due course, okay? And so they're taken to the hospital. They are of course stabilized and resuscitated en route to the hospital and they're handed over to the relevant authorities in your emergency departments. Of the 24 hospitals that we have across Jamaica, 19 are fully equipped to provide emergency care with emergency trained staff. And so of course they reach the hospital, there is a system where they're sifted out by the process of triage, they're registered and so they're pushed into the system. If they're, if they're unstable, of course, there's a mechanism for them to go into the operating theater. And of course, there is a process of rehabilitation and they're sent home. Or in the worst case scenarios, they may not make it out of hospital, but at least the system and the processes are there to salvage these patients. So the key areas of action would include providing a system to activate your post-crash response. And this means putting in place a system where a dedicated phone is made available to the public free of cost so that they can call to a trained person who can coordinate and dispatch the relevant service providers, as you would have seen in the previous diagram. We need to build the capacity to provide an appropriate response. So in the ideal world, we want to train medical first responders at the community level. And when I say community level, we want to train persons in the community, such as teachers. You want to train your taxi operators, your bus drivers, persons who are interfacing and interacting with a large number of persons at any one time. I'm happy to say that in Jamaica, we do have the enhanced medical care, as I've alluded to with the provision of free medical care in Jamaica, regardless of your status, that we, uh, we have universal access to care at all our hospitals without asking for money. And so we do not have any prohibition for persons access, accessing emergency care. Of course, as I mentioned in the slide earlier, we need to establish a multidisciplinary post-crash investigation arm of this discussion since it will inform us how best to put policies and procedures in place to prevent further accidents. This diagram really uh, was developed by NERGIS. I really applaud them for putting this map together for me. 
And what this map shows us are the seven emergency medical um, services sites across Jamaica. We have the Waterford, we have Linstead, we have two new sites that are due to be opened in short order, possibly by December in Ocherius and St. Anne's Bay. We have Falmouth, we have Iron Shore, uh, Lucy, Savlamar, and Negril. So we have, um, I want to say nine, but we really have seven operational EMS sites across Jamaica. And if you look at where they're strategic, strategically located, they're located close in close proximity to your major hospitals, usually within a five kilometer um, radius. And I know that the Jamaica Fire Brigade have been very keen in, in rolling out new MS sites. And I think this will come into the discussion that Mr. Dixon will have with us later on. So this is good news for the country. So what does our statistics show? So I, I was able to put together the information sent by Superintendent Dixon together. And every month a report is sent to the Ministry of Health detailing the types of accidents and trauma that they recover in Jamaica. So let's look at the post-crash recovery data. Um, this is what they're seeing at the seven operational EMS sites for 2021. Um, this is Falmouth, Waterford, Linstead, Lucy, Ironshore, Negril, and Savlamar. And these are the different months, January, February, right up to May. And you can see the trends in terms of the numbers of cases that they're seeing. What is quite apparent in this graph is that a number of cases are coming from the western end of the island. And you can see Negril poking its, its, its head out right here in terms of the highest, or the highest numbers that you're seeing across the island. Um, if we look at the bike accidents, and I know Mrs. Fletcher is particularly keen on this data, um, the Jamaica Fire Brigade has really started to capture this key um, data set uh, since June of last year. But for this year, what we're seeing, and if you see these gaps here, it means that there were no cases in terms of motorbike accidents. So this is for January. So you'd have seen um, Savlamar, Negril, and Falmouth. And this is a total number of cases that you'd have seen from that end of the island. Similarly, you would have seen Savlamar, Negril, and again, Falmouth, the total number seen there, okay, for this year. And I actually put in this trend bar here to show you what the highest numbers that were seen in Negril. Um, it, it started off high, but it's sort of trending down a little. So not much improvement, but I know that Mrs. Fletcher will speak a little about the interventions being made by the National Road Safety Council in this regard. If we look at the years gone by, I sort of condensed this diagram together. The total numbers you would appreciate are in the brown, and these are for January at the seven EMS sites across the island, February going all the way down. And you can see this is the road traffic accident response made by the Jamaica Fire Brigade for 2020. And if we look at the bike accidents, um, we didn't have a lot of accidents captured in the data for last year since June, dark blue is the June, but just look at the total numbers um, that was accumulated for the, for the last half of the year starting at June, you'll see the trend right here in this graph. I also wanted to touch on a little about the number of calls that the Jamaica Fire Brigade receives from the general public across the seven EMS sites. Um, January, February, March, April, May, and the trend continues along um, the seven EMS sites. And you can see the numbers that they receive usually are uh, just a little under um, 100 for each station. In terms of cumulative numbers that's received for the entire January, you'll see most of these are usually closer to 400. And this, these numbers can be dissected a little bit more to reflect those that are not responded to. But if in a general month, you may have 400 calls, 20 to 30 to 40 may not be responded to because of challenges um, with the vehicles or for other reasons. But in the country areas, it's good to know that persons are able to walk into Jamaica Fire Brigade to seek help and attention. 
And this was a total cause that was seen for the year prior. Similar numbers that you're seeing per EMS um, station. So in terms of the short-term goals, what can we achieve? I, I certainly believe that we can have an or, organized and integrated pre-hospital emergency system and emergency care system, which already exists in our country, but we can certainly advance it to include capacity for a better response. We have ensured access to emergency care through our universal healthcare accessibility. We have not yet been able to provide universal access numbers, but we know that is in train and I'll show you a graph. I'll show you a picture just now to confirm that um, sentiment. Uh, we need to train individuals from a central level in how to dispatch the appropriate service for the right sort of disaster or accident. I'm um, happy to say that one of the presenters on today, Dr. Hugh Wong, also a trained emergency physician like myself, uh, operates the biggest trauma center in the English speaking Caribbean, that being Kingston Public Hospital. So we do have that in place already. Consideration must therefore be given to um, open another center in the Western end of the island. That's another consideration. And to provide a national coordination agency that can galvanize all of these crucial elements. What I must also say is that KPH and the University Hospital and Cornwall Regional being type A facilities do receive a number of cases that are transferred via our helicopter um, dispatch in country. So we do have helicopter medical evacuation or casualty evacuation that is operated exclusively by the JDF. And that resource is always available in our country, which is another piece of good news. The training in medical first responder, basic life support, advanced cardiac life support, and pediatric life support has been happening in the country. However, COVID-19 brought a stop to that exercise, but that um, Dr. Wong will speak more exclusively about those training programs. And just to confirm the, the assertion I made earlier, um, the project for the improvement of an emergency communication system is in progress. There is integration of the National Works Agency who are using their microwave network for data communication. And it is really built on the backbone that we need to have a centralized communication system dedicated to responding to any sort of disasters or emergencies in country. So not only do we need to develop a national emergency communication system dedicated and coordinated at a national level, we need to allow our emergency response agency and responders to communicate exclusively with the aim of building out a, an efficient post crash response system. That is the end of my presentation, over to you. Um, well, I did not know that there were so many options available here in Jamaica for us. Um, I, that was very informative. Thank you so much. Um, we will move straight uh, right along into the next presentation by Dr. Hu Wong. Dr. Wong. Thank you for um, are you hearing me? Um, thank you for inviting me, Dr. Espinosa Campbell, and by extension, the RSU. Um, I present as the chairman of the National Resuscitation Council, and this is an NGO that was founded in the Ministry of Health some years ago, with the primary um, role of overseeing CPR training um, organizations in Jamaica. And this is to make sure that the different organizations that are teaching CPR and resuscitation are adhering to the standards and are teaching uniform materials and that the instructors are certified. Um, my other hat as mentioned by Dr. Espinosa is that I'm the head of department of the Accident and Immersive Department at the Kingston Public Hospital, um, which Dr. Espinosa states as the, a, a trauma center. I prefer to say that it's a hospital that sees lots of trauma. Um, and briefly, some of our stats, I just looked it up that in January, we saw 182 motor vehicle accident victims, um, 113 in February, 118 in May, 
126 in April and 120 in May. So we do see quite a bit. So I'll just go into my presentation now. Let me share my screen. Everybody seeing my screen? Please tell me. Yes, we are. Okay, excellent. So, um, research station training courses that are available in Jamaica. So, there are a number of training organizations that currently operate in the island of Jamaica. These include the St. John Ambulance Services, the Heart Foundation of Jamaica, um, and through Heart Foundation is a training center. We have two training sites, the Heart Foundation itself, and then we have the Free Hospital Emergency Medical Services Training Center at the University of the Hospital of the West Indies, and the Ministry of Health and Wellness. We also have um, the Northern and Caribbean University, University of Technology, Red Cross, Fulfillment Association of Diving Instructors, Emergency Care and Safety Institute, EMS Safety, Training Institute of NYC, um, Royal Life Saving Society, Emergency First Aid and Safety Training, EFAST. These are organizations that are currently registered with NRC, right? And are certified to provide CPR instructor training. So what are the courses available to us? All courses that are taught in a resuscitation are based on the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation Science, right? And this was formed in 1992 and their member organizations include the American Heart Association, the European Resuscitation Council, the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, Inter-American Heart Foundation, the Royal, the Royal um, South Africa and the Resuscitation Council of Asia. And what the ILCOR has done is provide a standardized approach to resuscitation. All CPR manuals instructions are derived from ILCOR. So the different courses taught whether through St. John's or the Heart Foundation will be based on the same material. So what are the type of courses available for medical professionals, basic life support, advanced cardiac life support, pediatric life support, advanced life support, basic life support, as I said before, emergency care and trauma ECA training through PAHO, and advanced trauma life support that is taught at um, University of Hospital West Indies. For non-medical professionals, there are CPR courses, first aid, CPR, um, and family and friends. These are courses for non-medical professionals, and these courses are taught by the Heart Foundation, um, as well as the CPR course, non-medical courses are taught by the other groups I've just mentioned. Now, um, what is the facility for CPR and trauma? This is a little bit controversial, but I need to mention it because I know the thrust is, um, I'm, I'm talking about cardiac arrest. I'm not really talking about patients who have suffered injury and um, our survival loop. Um, and that's where CPR comes in and CPR and trauma. So there's a trimodal distribution of deaths after tra traumatic injury. So somebody will meet an accident and die immediately, all right? They die immediately or they may die early on arrival at hospital or they may die some weeks after treatment. And the focus on prevention of is function and prevention of early and subsequent delayed deaths. We can't do anything about immediate deaths, really, All right? And the premise is that immediate deaths require public health, legislative, and engineering, all right? And is not responsive to CPR, okay? In other words, many studies have shown, there are a number of studies have shown that patients with traumatic injuries that suffer cardiac arrest at the scene have poor prognosis, all right? Uh, however, recent studies have indicated that resuscitative efforts on these traumatic cardiac arrest victims do lead to survival in some patients. However, the first responders in those studies were medical personnel and not lay persons. Right? So in terms of training, it would be incumbent upon us that our persons who are responding to these crash accidents will have some medical training, right? And we don't expect lay persons to perform CPR or the success of lay persons doing CPR on somebody who has a traumatic arrest is going to have an improved outcome. 
I'm just stating that for, for the record. What is the role of CPR in out of hospital cardiac arrest, whether traumatic or atraumatic? Gives all persons a chance for survival. And if we realize that usually, for example, CPR is required, um, usually given by a family member or a coworker. All persons should be taught CPR. All persons should be taught CPR. Uh, which has shown in many studies to improve survival in patients suffering cardiac arrest. It is proven in a certain cardiac arrest, however, is not so much in traumatic cardiac arrest. So in summary, all persons should learn CPR. They should be encouraged to prepare to use their, their knowledge of CPR in both sudden cardiac arrest and in traumatic cardiac arrest. There are many, many factors that contribute to the survival or non-survival of the patient and a pre-hospital care is only a part of the trauma management system and it goes into hospital well as well. And we will all agree that lots need, more needs to be done in terms of our trauma response systems, all right? So here I'll end my presentation just to, to re reiterate that these are some of the different organizations that are available for us to have training in CPR, all right? And I will also say that the Heart Foundation, sorry, the NRC, the NRC has been seeking funding to have a island-wide CPR training for lay persons. And this would have been in 2019, 2020, but you know, um, Corona came along and has put us back a little bit, but that is still in, um, in train. And our intention is to train um, a thousand persons island wide in CPR um, over the course of a year. Um, and there I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Wang. Um, hello, Ms. Campbell, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Oh, thank you for having me. Let me thank the Road Safety Council for inviting us to be, you know, a part of this forum as you celebrate World, World Road Safety Month. As we discuss the need for citizens to be trained in emergency and first responders, there are three things that we have to take into consideration. And I'm going to look at three Ps. We need to preserve life we need to prevent worsening, and we need to promote recovery. Now, how can someone be trained in first aid and CPR be able to do all of those three? First of all, preserving a life is like you're trying to save someone's life, especially in case of an emergency. And you should be trained in that area to prevent anything or to prevent the casualty from becoming worse. For example, we also have to look at more help, which is required by trained persons, which would enable them to save lives. For example, when you go on a scene, it is likely as a first responder or trained first aider, you will see other persons there before you. Each person will have their different motive. Some will want to take pictures. Some would want a video. They want to be the first one to put whatever they see on social media. As a trained first aider, you must always be prepared. When you go on the scene, you must check for scene safety. There are many things that can make a scene unsafe. Gunshot firing, electrical wire dangling, smoke, fire. Then when you assess the scene and realize that it is safe, you must identify yourself. You need to make a difference to the bystanders who you are and that you are there to assist. Most importantly, you must always wear a pair of latex gloves. More so now, you need 
to be wearing a proper fitted mask to prevent any form of contamination. You also should have on hand a triangular bandage, neck brace if necessary, and a neck brace can be improvised by making one. If you have a triangular bandage, you can use a sheet of newspaper, wrap, in it, wrap it in it so that the neck can be secure. Responsibility also, as a first aider, you must check for unresponsiveness. So you're going to look and see if there is a rise and fall of the chest. And you are going to check the carotid pulse. If there's no pulse, and if you do not see the rise and fall of the chest, then if you are trained to do CPR, you are going to start to administer chest compressions. And of course, you would call for help. Call the ambulance, call the fire. If it is a motor vehicle accident, we just classify it as trauma. There can be situations where you cannot get to remove the casualty from the motor vehicle the motor vehicle. So you would have to get the assistance of the fire brigade to come and assist you. How do you administer CPR or chest compression? As I said before, if you are not trained to administer first aid and CPR, do not attempt to do so because you can be doing more harm than good. With the use of the mask and the proper way in which you are going to perform CPR is very crucial. Of course, the Jamaica Red Cross offers training in first aid and CPR. Anyone can learn first aid. It is easy to learn. For further information on how to become a trained first aider or a responder, you can contact the Jamaica Red Cross Central Village Headquarters, 984-7860-2. Or any Red Cross branch in your parish. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Miss Campbell. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, our next presenter was supposed to be Mrs. Paula Fletcher from the National Road Safety Council. However, she sends her apologies as she's having some connectivity issues and will be unable to join us again. She was here earlier, but her connectivity went out and she's unable to join us. So um, this wraps up our presentations for today. I would like to open the floor now to any questions that you may have. Um, if there are any questions, we will take them now. Hello, is everyone hearing me? Great. Um, so my question is for was for um, our professionals in the health services, Dr. Campbell or Mr. Wong, or even the Red Cross. Um, I know because I am a lay person, I'm in road safety. However, when it comes to the matter of post crash care, what when it's beyond legislation and policy, I have a question in regards to the public being trained. So if I understand Dr. Wong's presentation, CPR, there are certain aspects of CPR that really is there is not recommended for when some post crash when somebody is a victim of crash and if you can confirm that for me and when would the possibility in terms of you know is there any possibility in in regards to that and how it should be handled if somebody wants to help Mrs. Campbell, you want me to answer that or you want to start? Oh, 
All right, so let me attempt to answer that question. And thank you for the question. The idea behind training different levels of healthcare providers are to create a linkage in the healthcare system, first of all. So in the first instance, you want to ensure that persons in the community um, are trained as medical first responders. So their key role and responsibility is to recognize when an accident has happened, number one, and know when to make the call to a high level of care. In addition to that, if they recognize within that linkage that there are persons who are able to offer higher prioritized level of care, like basic life support or advanced life support, or if it's a child, pediatric um, advanced life support, then they will create linkage until help arrives. Again, uh, a medical first responder is able to call uh, the Jamaica Fire Brigade EMS, and I've strategically shown on the map where they are located. Um, and certainly that is another avenue where persons can get help. Um, but certainly the, the role of training is to recognize when there's an injury, when to call for help. That's basically that for a medical first responder. Okay. I just wanted to add, all right, so thank you, Dr. Campbell. I was having an issue with my mic, but I just wanted to add that um, since Mrs. Fletcher isn't here, she was actually deep, was going to look at the vision for post-crash response in regards to where we hope it would be. Um, some of it is linked back to our old decade of action under the global um, road safety plan, but within this future look, you know, there were different aspects regarding having outsiders, meaning what they would call a person who was unseen, they would call a good Samaritan legislation to help protect persons who were trying to assist and give help. Now, I know there's a lot to be said what, you know, international companies, well, international organizations recommendations, we don't have to accept it, but, you know, we have to look at things culturally for us where we can lend support because sometimes I on the news we hear of instances where persons are like the bog walk gorge there is a team of persons who seem to be always on hand helping to rescue persons from the gorge and that you know one have those persons in those areas being trained and if you know we could look to as persons in the sector or in the arena to point out those communities or sites to give them that particular training. And I'm so happy to hear that, you know, the Ministry of Health is embarking on this. And if our public, you know, were aware, aware of it and could lend themselves, given their location, and, you know, as Dr. Campbell alluded to, the amount of persons they're interacting with, that would really go a far way in stemming the tide in terms of what are injuries that may lead, you know, to fatalities. Also, we're, you know, in the future vision for guidance by the global fund you know we're looking at matters of understanding where this data comes from in terms of trauma registries because you know as individual organizations we keep our own records and data but you know as a road safety as the road safety unit we collect incidences of crashes record fatalities but one of the things we recognize that we would like to embark on is to have a better understanding of injury and how that impacts our country you know, in real dollars and cents. And I realized that the Ministry of Health can go a far way in helping us in getting that type of data. So I'm happy to hear that one, it's been collected, it's, you know, it's there and how we could work together to bring public awareness to the true impacts because we, most persons can not necessarily, attend, you know, recognize a fatality because they may not have known somebody who, who have died, but people usually have gotten hurt at some point in time in their lives and may respond better to having data on injury as you know it's up the probability and the risk of it you know the risk of happening to them is quite real and you know we can give evidence for this so i really want to thank the team from red cross from you know ministry of health from council the it and from the police you know for you know coming into this discussion and really putting giving the pub caring public awareness 
putting public awareness out there so we can have a better idea as not only stakeholders, but as, you know, as members of the Jamaican citizenry ourselves. So thank you so much. We really, truly appreciate it. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Sinclair. If there are no other questions, are there any other questions? Let me check over here. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we will wrap this up. It is, we're a little bit over time, but I think it was so worthwhile. We learned a whole lot and I'm sure we have some very good takeaways from today's discussion. Um, our next meeting, talk discussion will happen this Friday at, uh, at noon, same time over Zoom. And we, and we are again inviting everybody to join us. Um, we, we will just have that discussion again at the final of our, of our series for this month. I'm pretty sure we will be seeing more along the way. And it will and, be on motorcycle safety. Oh. And the, sorry, the next session will be on motorcycle safety. Motorcycle safety. That's a, that's a strong one for me. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I hope you to all see you all there next week. Tell a friend to tell a friend. And we can all just join in the discussion and have a full some discussion about it. So thank you once again, everyone, for your participation, for your presence, um, for your insight. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you at the end of the week on Friday. Same time, same place. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you for now. having us. Thank you. Thank you.